Uh, before I begin, I request everyone to please mute themselves. Thank you. Warm greetings from the Chennai Center for China Studies. It's great to meet you all in another C3S book conversation. Our today's discussion is on the book World History and National Identity in China in the 20th Century by Dr. Shi Fan. To introduce the topic, history and tradition have always played an influential role in defining the domestic and foreign politics of the People's Republic of China, where we can see nationalism is pervasive in China even today. Yet, nationalism is not entrenched in China's intellectual tradition. Over the course of the 20th century, the combined forces of cultural, social, and political transformations nourished China's development, but the resistance to it has also persisted parallelly. The author of this book examines the ways in which historians working on the world beyond China and from within China have attempted to construct narratives that challenge nationalist readings of the Chinese past and the influence that these historians have had on the formation of Chinese identity. He also traces the ways in which generations of historians from the late Qing through the Republican period, through the Mao period to the relative moment of openings in the 1980s have attempted to break cross-cultural boundaries in writing an alternate version to the national narrative. With this brief introduction, it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker and author of this book, Dr. Shi Fan. He is an associate professor of history at the State University of New York at Fredonia, a historian of modern China with a strong interest in world history. In his work, he is fascinated by three general issues in historiography and intellectual history in a world historical context. The three questions that he always raises is, what is the relationship between past and present in a modern society? What is the relationship between foreign knowledge and indigenous intellectual tradition in a country where nationalism increasingly plays a dominant role in shaping its political consciousness? And the final question he raises is, how have cultural, social, and political conditions affect the production of knowledge in a non-Western society such as China during the 20th century? With these questions in mind, the author developed a broad interest in issues of knowledge production, which includes the sociology of knowledge, post-colonial theory, and recent developments in world and global history. Thank you for joining us and pleasure having you with us, sir. I now request Commodore Aras Vasan, Director General C3S, to kindly deliver the open address, opening address. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bala. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And a uh, hearty welcome to Professor Jinhan. And uh, it's, it's great that uh, he's with us today. I know it required a little bit of scheduling on our part to get him on board because he was a little hesitant when he looked at our website. He said, uh, looks like, you know, Chennai Center for China Studies is more interested in, uh, you know, international relations, strategy, military, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, I told him, I said, you know, we've always been looking at culture, historical relations uh, since our inception. It is just that during the standoff, uh, you know, the last two and a half years, the focus has been a little different. So we do apologize for this change of focus, but that was necessitated by circumstances which are there. Uh, I'm also very happy to acknowledge the presence of Professor Surin Narayan, who, is here, who was the head of uh, South and Southeast Asian Studies, Colonel uh, Hariharan and Admiral Muldigaran, uh, Mr. L.V. Krishnan, who all have closely followed the developments in China. As far as uh, the book discussion today is concerned, Bola has already set the tone for the discussion. Uh, there is not much I need to add to this because the floor obviously belongs to Professor Shinpon. But I would like to uh, just say a few words uh, to, to ensure that uh, you know the flow of thought is uh, synchronized with uh, uh, what Bala has already said. <clears throat> you know whether it is India or China, history has always played a phenomenal uh, role in shaping the destiny of these nations, and therefore the very definition of nation, statehood, you know nationality, uh, patriotism. All these have undergone transformations depending on the historical occurrences that have taken place. So, you know, in the case of China, you know, which has got a 4,000 year old history, uh, you see how it has evolved, you know, from the time when they considered themselves to be at the center of the universe in the Middle Kingdom. You know, everybody today calls it the Middle Kingdom syndrome, but they firmly believed that they were at the center of the universe and everybody else was uh, there to serve them or their interests. So, this itself uh, metamorphosized as. Uh, nations evolved as the surroundings changed, as the geography had a role to play, 
in, uh, in, in the transformation of these ethos, national ethos. So you found that, uh, you know, things started changing. And uh, historians, of course, uh, uh, like Professor Shin Fon will definitely tell you that a lot of this can be identified and traced to the, the Ming dynasty, you know, when the Manchus were in, uh, uh, you know, in uh, rule. And uh, apparently, they, it, it said that, you know, the 13th century, around thereabouts, where you know, people tried to uh, bring in the sense of nationalism. Again, you know, we all are aware of uh, what all happened after that, uh, the defeat of China, the, the, the introduction of the uh, Sino-Chinese, uh, Sino-Russian conflict, then the Sino-Japanese conflict, and then the World War itself, which changed the entire uh, way in which the Chinese citizens were treated. Uh, Professor Surinaran here, uh, you know, is well aware of the two opium wars which were fought, and you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, it was it changed uh, within the boundaries of China. In addition, we also know that, uh, you know, Taiwan itself, which is still a burning issue today, was uh, entirely due to the, 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 the communism that uh, took root, uh, the so-called uh, revolution that took place in China, you know, which allowed the KMT to move on to Taiwan. So, you know, even today, if you look at the Taiwanese uh, flag, you know, it has five different colors, indicating that, you know, they are trying to get all the five uh, ethnic relations together. And today, when you look at China again, no, this, while not standing the difference, even China, you know, we visited China along with Colonel uh, Hariharan in uh, Kunming uh, some uh, eight, ten years ago. And there was at least a visible uh, effort to get all the ethnics together and uh, build in this uh, narrative of Chinese <coughs> nationalism. So how much they have evolved is something that uh, Professor Xinfan will uh, analyze. But I can only draw a certain amount of parallel in how India has shifted its own nationalism and history. You know, we also were on similar lines. You know, of course, India was not perhaps a united Bharat as we say today, but there were many kingdoms, which was also evident in many other uh, uh, countries. So there again, after the, the colonization, we found that there was a certain amount of uh, expression of the way of nationalism, whether it is for the freedom struggle or thereafter in building the nation. So the building up of the nation, the national development, the absorption of and the commitment to, to democracy and secular values have changed the very concept of nationalism in, in our narrative. So this is where you can draw a certain amount of uh, parallels with what is happening in China today. China has evolved as a nation. They are scientifically advanced. They, of course, they have moved uh, far away from the so-called Confucius uh, values of uh, society and uh, uh, you know uh, governance, but certain amount of impact is still there. After all, you know your roots still are there with uh, whether it is Sun Tzu or Confucius. Some of these roots are there, and the lessons that they taught have not been uh, forgotten by by the, even the present Chinese leader leadership. Of course, what changed was uh, you know when they became a communist country, and you know we had the so-called uh, cultural revolution which meant that so many people who are not falling in line were uh, uh, purged from the, the society. And uh, thereafter, the so-called uh, leap, uh, you know, the leap was to nowhere in assessment of some of the historians, but I'm sure Professor Shinfan will tell us whether it was leap that led to some place or whether it was something that took them into a deep pit. We do not know that I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm a military man by profession, but last 15 days I've been trying to pretend that I'm also an academician. So uh, Professor Shinfan can excuse me for, uh, you know, pretending to be a uh, historian, which I'm not. So I'm only trying to learn from history. As everyone tells you, particularly also in the Naval Corps College, where the area study of mine was China, and there are also a directing staff. We always try to tell students that, you know, those who do not learn by history are condemned to repeat it. So this is the lessons that we have as far as that. So therefore, it's important for any person, you know, whether it's a friendly country or an adversary, it's, for, it's important for us to understand how these nations have evolved and how this concept of nationalism today has taken deep roots and how some of the very concept of nationalism and statehood, you know, comes into conflict with the way we look at these very, uh, you know, ethos. So that this is uh, where uh, I'm looking forward to your talk, Professor because uh, we are very keenly interested in uh, 
uh, you know how history has impacted uh, the nationalism and statehood and the way uh, communist china behaves today and how it interacts and relates with the other countries of the world and how today it's become it's come to be seen as uh, uh, a country that is in conflict with uh, many others uh, you know there are very few friends according to the observers but those are issues which i would uh, request you to dwell upon and see how you know what is it that perhaps defines the behavior of communist china today you know is it something that we can uh, look up to in terms of normalizing relations because in india you know elections will be very important to us in terms of how we can perhaps normalize our relations uh, with china you know what are the issues of conflict what is it this misunderstanding that's taking place along the border you know what are the other issues of economy trade uh, issues of conflict and cooperation so uh, i would not like to take too much of time my job was to give a few uh, you know uh, words on, uh, on on the entire concept and i i have given you my take on uh, how i look at this entire issue of uh, you know china's place in uh, a modern world and how history has shaped its own uh, uh, you know the construct as, as a society so thank you very much professor for accepting our invitation to be with us all of us eagerly look forward to your talk uh, over to you and thank you very much for being with us uh, thank you sir uh, professor i think i'll share so that you know there is no interruption in your talk the flow is good i'll share it from my end once you say next slide uh, i can change it is that fine with you it's uh, okay um or i can just share this with me uh, either way is fine with me yeah i'll just share it immediately and whenever you say next i can go to, i can move on to the next slide. okay um are you sharing it i don't I'm see do, it I, i'm doing it now it's coming up okay excellent thanks a lot uh, uh well uh, bala is uh, sharing my uh, screen let me just uh, say a few words uh, about today's uh, presentation um, first of all, it's an um, it's honor uh, for me uh, to be here to have this conversation with all of you. Uh, for me, this is especially meaningful because I'm actually uh, sitting in the German city, Göttingen. I'm not sure how many of you uh, know of that place. It's a university town in the middle of Germany. But uh, for the relationship between China and India, this is significant because in the 1930s and 1940s, the uh, renowned historian in the uh, Indonologist uh, Ji Xianlin uh, studied here for 10 years, a decade. And later he returned to China and he created the field of Indian studies in China. So this is a significant place. It is a symbolic place. It is a symbolic place between uh, of the relationship and the friendship between India and uh, China, two ancient civilizations and two rising powers. For me, uh, today's conversation is especially meaningful because I'm speaking to you in this uh, historically significant place, Göttingen. And the second thing I would like to say is, um, um, indeed, I was a little bit hesitant uh, uh, to accept this invitation um, for the reason that you know. I'm a historian, um, and uh, my work is really about uh, the things that happened in the past. And uh, I do not own the expertise uh, to talk about things that are happening now and that will happen in the future. But uh, I agree with what uh, Mr. Vanson mentioned. Uh, this is a conversation that we should have. This is a conversation that we should have between historians and uh, policy makers and the foreign policy uh, uh, researchers. So for me, I guess being here on the one hand is to introduce my book, is to introduce uh, my study and my work. On the other hand, I feel this as a humble opportunity to learn, to learn from all of you uh, as a student. And in fact, this goes back to the ancient tradition that we share, both China and India. Um, Going all the way back to Confucius, he had this famous saying that uh, in our life, the mission is to pursue Tao, which is the fundamental truth. And then Confucius said, in the morning, we hear the Tao. In the evening, it's OK for us to die. So in other words, I guess learning uh, this sort of conversation 
and the uh, communication is a mission for us. And uh, I'm a humble student here. Okay, let me just uh, say a few words about my book. Uh, this book, World History and the National Identity in China, uh, was published last year by Cambridge University Press. And this book is based on um, um, 10 years of work of mine. I started uh, doing the basic research while I was a graduate student. And later I got my job. And I was I'm teaching uh, in the United States, uh, going to the archives in China, and eventually I, I was able to finish the book. So for me, it is really exciting right, for me uh, to, to share this book uh, project with you. Uh, can we move, move, move to the next slide? Uh, right, there are a couple, there are three things I would like to say in the beginning of today's presentation. Um, there are three issues I would like to mention. One is um, the rise of China is a common um, question we share the concern with, the rise of China. However, I feel that um, uh, if you look at the literature from an international relations studies or uh, the literature from the West, oftentimes there's a misunderstanding or there's a bias. That is, uh, these uh, policy thinkers tend to apply a historical framework or decision-making process that is embedded uh, in the view of the West. And therefore, I feel it is meaningful for us to think about what is the Chinese view of the world. In order to understand where China is going to, we have to understand where China came from. And I feel this is a niche that my historical work can contribute to the ongoing conversation regarding the rise of China a little bit. So this is the first point. And the second point is, when we are talking about Chinese nationalism, this is a hot topic. A lot of scholars have been writing about it. And the question here is, do we know too much about Chinese nationalism, or do we know too little about Chinese nationalism? And some scholars even argue, today, if you study nationalism, it's like beating a dead horse. It's already outdated. I don't think so. Because in my research, I will present you the other side of the story. A lot of scholars have been writing about the rise of nationalism in China. But I am trying to write about uh, how the people in China are trying to resist nationalism, trying to embrace global views over the past 100 years. So this is my humble contribution to the studies of nationalism uh, from uh, the perspective of China. So this is the second point. And the third point is, as I mentioned in the beginning, and uh, as I um, have to acknowledge that I am a historian. And uh, my work is focused on the writing of history in China. And to a lot of people, this can be a boring or highly specialized topic. So what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to look at a small issue, but then I'm trying to zoom out using that small topic to try to make sense the bigger changes of national identity and the understanding of world history in China over the course of the 20th century. The focus is historiography, the writing of world history in China. And the writing of world history in China actually is a very big topic because hundreds, if not thousands of scholars are doing research about the world history in China. And in my study, I'm selecting a specific case that is a, a subfield of world historical studies in China, which is called a ancient world history. Uh, it's a relatively small field, but the scholars in this field are dealing with two fundamental conflicts and tensions in terms of the Chinese understanding of the world. One is they're doing study about the ancient history. In other words, they are doing study of the history that is beyond the Industrial Revolution, beyond the European and the Western dominance of the world. Two is it is world history. It's not necessarily about China. It is about uh, the entire world. So 
from these two uh, potential approaches, I feel I could locate a niche through which I can tell an interesting story about uh, the formation of modern identities in China. So these are the three perspectives I would like to introduce in the beginning of the presentation. Um, can we move, move to the next slide, please? And let me just briefly uh, uh, introduce the content of the book. The book follows the rise of the subfield of uh, world historical studies in China, ancient world history. I started uh, in late Qing, um, around uh, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. You can see at that time, world history as a concept was introduced uh, from the West, from Europe, from Japan to China. This is the first part of my book. And the second part of the book, I'm dealing with the Republican period, which is the KMT period from 1912 to 1949. In this period, I argue world history is understood most likely as Western history. And it emerged into a field of teaching, historical teaching. So I argue this is the critical moment for the rise of a world historical pedagogy in China. That's the second part of the book. The third part of the book I'm dealing with the People's Republic of China. In other words, the Communist China. And I have two chapters that are dealing with 1950s. These two chapters are talking about a story, how world history evolved from the field of teaching into a field of research under the influence of Marxist ideology. So that's the third part of the book. And then the last part of the book is after the death of Mao in the 1980s to the end of the um, 20th century. Uh, during this period, you can see the field of ancient world history became increasingly professionalized and specialized. So these are the four periods of study in this book. And together, I have uh, five chapters. Uh, so pretty much uh, one chapter on one period. But uh, for the 1950s, I have uh, two chapters. So in other words, the 1950s is one of the focuses of this book. Then please allow me to go over the central arguments from each chapter, if it's OK. Shall we move to the next slide, please? As I mentioned, there are five chapters in total in this book. And each chapter is dealing with one critical issue, one sort of tension in the formation of a Chinese identity. The first chapter, I'm trying to deal with this conflict between tradition and the modernity. In the past, a lot of people assumed that the Chinese tradition was a tradition of a stagnation. It's a tradition that was against modernity. Traditional China was isolated. Traditional society was a lack of a change. And in this chapter, the first chapter of my book, I'm looking into a case study, which is a book that was published in 1901 in Shanghai. And perhaps this is the first Chinese language book on ancient world history, which was written by a amateur history writer and a medical practitioner. So it's a really interesting story for this person to write this book on ancient world history. But in this book, this author was trained as a Confucian scholar. And he's now challenging Confucianism at all. And in fact, he's, he was all operating his inquiry into world history through the framework of Confucianism. However, 
we don't see that he's stagnant. I don't see he's against uh, the West. I don't see he's embracing isolationism. In fact, throughout the book, he has one central argument, and he repeats this argument all the time. What's, he, what's his argument? The argument is human beings are the same. Regardless of the West and the East, we're the same. We're the same, we have the same intelligence. So you can see from a Confucianism, he actually was arguing a global idea that China and the West were fundamentally similar. And you can see this is the book. The book, its title is called Xi Shi Gang Mu. And we can literally translate it as outline of Western history. But at the same time, you have to understand this Western history not is, is not just the history of the West. It is the history West of China, including India, and sometimes even including Japan. So it's a very general framework of a reference. Shall we move to the next slide, please? If this person was writing this alone, then this work was insignificant. And in the second part of my chapter on this book, on this issue, I was able to identify the social network of knowledge production for this book's author. This book's author name here is Zhou Weihan. You can see the image located at the center of the social network. And according to my research, he was well connected to the gentry network that was centered around the Yangtze Delta region. In other words, he was not writing ancient world history alone. And he was not promoting the idea about this common uh, humanity of the people between the West and China alone. He's doing this with a group of intellectuals and the gentry scholars. Some of these scholars were his friends, and some of these uh, individuals were his relatives. And some of them became uh, famous historians, and some of them uh, became the uh, major uh, administrators at uh, major universities. For example, one of them uh, was the, um, um, the director of ag academic affairs of Peking University. And some of them became famous poets, famous writers. So you can see this uh, well-connected uh, social network of knowledge production. In other words, this idea, China was not alone. China is integrated a part of the world, was not an isolated idea. It was an idea that was embraced by many individuals like him. So this is the first chapter. Shall we move to the next slide, uh, slide, uh, slide please? Thank you. Um, the next chapter, I'm dealing with the rise of uh, academic nationalism in China. But this process is a contingent process. And here I'm dealing with two issues. One is the rise of internationalism. Here I have uh, three individuals who wrote about the uh, world history in China. The first one, Chen Hengzhe, she was the first female professor teaching in China. The second one, He Bingsong, was a famous administrator and a world history professor teaching in China. And the last person, Lei Haizong, again, was a very respected historian um, and the chair of the Tsinghua History Department in wartime China. All of them were educated in the United States, and all of them were writing about the world history. And following the changing decades from the 1920s to 1940s, you can see two things. One is, in the beginning, you can see Chinese uh, educated elites were embracing the idea of internationalism. By the 1940s, during the time of war, as the country was in crisis, 
some of them gave up on this idea of internationalism and started to embrace uh, nationalism and even cultural uh, fascism. But there's a reason for that. We'll talk about it later. For example, um, Chen Hongzhe, right, this uh, professor teaching at the Peking University in the, er, uh, in the 19, uh, tens, late 1910s and the early 1920s, she wrote a book, a textbook on world history. And in that textbook, she argues the fundamental tension in this world was imperialism and internationalism. What China should do? China should embrace internationalism. And China should work with other countries in the colonial world to fight against imperialism. So this was her central argument. And this is a book published in uh, around the 19, early 1920s. And you can see at that time, in the wake of the Paris conference, in the time of the colonial, uh, anti-colonial awareness, right, she embraced the idea of internationalism. The international situation in China, for China at that time was relatively friendly, and she was able to do it. By the time of 1930s, He Bingsun, he published another book on world history, and they too actually knew each other, they were friends. And in that book, he made a similar argument, but slightly different. He argued, in this world, the fundamental tension was between imperialism and the nationalism. You see, in the first one, right, Chen Hongzhe, she argued the fundamental tension in the world was imperialism and internationalism. But by the 1930s, He Bingsun would argue the fundamental different uh, the tension would be international uh, imperialism and nationalism. He replaced nationalism with internationalism. And by the time of 1940s, the famous world historian in China, Lei Haizong, he was writing about the, the changing global situation, and he would argue war would be the fundamental solution to the world problem. And the, the war between China and the Japan would be, mo would be the moment of, of the re for the rejuvenation of a Chinese culture. So you can see from internationalism to nationalism to this strong sense of embracing a total solution to the war problem, you can see the change and the rhetoric among world historians in China became gradually radicalized. Let's move to the next slide, please. And that is very clear because this is related uh, to the changing situation in China. As I mentioned, 1920s was a time that was relatively peaceful for China. The international environment was okay. But the 1930s, you can see Japan gradually right, started to uh, uh, press China, started to uh, invade China to, and then the 1940s, it was a time of uh, total war. For Chinese historians, there's no way for them to continue to embrace the idea of liberalism and the internationalism. For them, the critical issue was really the solution of the nation. And in order for the nation to survive, they have to do whatever it takes. So this is uh, the chapter on the Republican period. Shall we move to the next slide, please? The next two chapters, chapter three and chapter four, were dealing with 1950s. And these two chapters are dealing with two dimensions of thinking. The first one is about the social production of knowledge. The second one is really about the, the uh, transformation of ideas, the tension between socialism, uh, uh, Marxism, and uh, a traditional uh, nationalism. So let's uh, talk about the first uh, chapter three first. The Communist Party took over China. But at that time, in the early 1950s, the Communist Party had a little influence over the higher education system. Why? Because in the revolutionary decades, the communists were primarily working in the countryside. They had a very little experience dealing with urban centers. They came to the uh, cities, they dominated the cities, but for them, it was a whole new mission to control 
the knowledge production system, which is the universities. And therefore, in the early 1950s, there was a wild confusion among uh, professors and teachers at the Chinese universities because they had no idea about what communism was. And the question here is, the Communist Party was determined to control the system. They, they, were, they were determined to control knowledge production. And for them, history was especially meaningful and useful for them to achieve the unification and to achieve the uh, totalization of China. So it was a mission for the Chinese government to control the higher education system. And how did they do it? They borrowed, they translated the Soviet system, teaching and research unit system, and they introduced that system into China. In other words, it was less about ideological control, rather about social control. They were putting people under the supervision um, through the system of teaching and research units it's called the Jiao Yan Shi system. And in this chapter, I'm dealing with a collective biography. I'm talking about the individual experiences for historians who went through that change. Some of them suffered in the new social system, and some of them, them uh, flourished. And here, the difference oftentimes is the younger generation who are less famous in the Republican period were more willing to work with the socialist regime. The older generation who were more famous in the Republican period, more established academicians who tended to reject that system and they suffered. So this is a story of individuals fighting against the social system. And that has some impact on the people's understanding of world history and also it shaped their identity of nationalism. Let's move to the next slide, please. And this is the central argument of uh, chapter four of my book. In this chapter, I'm dealing with a critical issue. That is, in the past, a lot of people argue Marxism, right? Marxist historiography in 1950s, 1960s in China was a handmaiden of political ideology. In other words, historians embraced the Marxist ideology, they lost the freedom, they lost their agency. And this is not my argument. And in this chapter, I'm looking at a debate among new generations of world history. In other words, these people embraced the socialism. But they, they were debating on this issue that is, what was the Asian mode of production, Asiatic mode of production? Uh, for people who are less familiar with Marxist historiography, let me just say a few words about it. Scholarly, uh, scholars generally believe that Marxist historiography is a teleological thinking. Teleological thinking. In other words, they see the world the development as the stage the development. And the Marxist historians divided the world history into five stages, from a primitive society to slave society to feudal society to um, capitalist society to communist society. And this is, well, so in, in a way, according to Karl Marx. However, in his own work, Karl Marx mentioned another system, which is called the Asiatic Morph Production, and the people were confused. Where should we place Asia at a mode of production in this five stage development? Was Asia at a mode of production a sort of feudalism or sort of slavery? And the historians in the communist world, they were debating about the issue. And this is particularly relevant because Asiatic mode of production is really about Asia. So where did China? fit into the five stages of all social and economic development of Marxist ideology, people were confused. And because, right, this is exactly because Marx, is, uh, Marx himself was not clear about uh, what Asiatic world fraction mean, right? And, and because of that, among historians, 
they were intensely debating about this issue. It's a boring debate. A lot of people think this is meaningless. But what am I trying to argue is, in the 1950s, the Chinese historians could do some meaningful work because the ideology, ideology was not perfect. The ambiguity of Marxism offered the possibility for Chinese historians to relatively freely discuss an issue because there's no blueprint for the state to control because the blueprint is flawed. So uh, this is the chapter four. And uh, following this sort of thinking, the two individuals I'm talking about, Tong Shu Yi and Lin Jichun, they were talking about Asian animal mode production, and they were looking into the history of ancient Mesopotamia. And they were using the history of ancient Mesopotamia to argue and to connect it to China, where China belonged to in the ancient world. So this is the central issue that we were talking about. Uh, shall we move to the next chapter? In the 1980s, after the death of Mao, China was liberating, was liberated in a way, right? So um, um, a lot of people were able to have a more uh, relatively free um, opportunity to discuss academic issues. So in this chapter, I'm dealing with the legacy of Marxist uh, ideology. I'm dealing in a way the legacy of the debate in the 1950s, such as the one on the Asiatic mode production. You can see in the early 1950s, uh, 1980s, historians like Tong Shu Yi and uh, Lin Chui, we just mentioned these two scholars, right? They were still debating about the same issue, Asiatic mode production. But gradually, they were transforming this Marxist debate into a debate about the true ancient world history, a global history. So they were debating about whether or not city-states existed in China. And they were debating whether or not labor created the human beings. And through these debates from 1980s to the 1990s, you can see gradually they were moving from Marxist free, uh, framework of historiography and created a, a new framework and a global references for world history. They were liberalizing ancient world history. Along with this process, the individuals who embraced socialism in the 1950s, they actually became the forerunners of introducing Western ideas, Western scholarship into China. So for example, my book, book writes about in the 1980s, Lin Jichun, the, the historian that I mentioned in the last slide, he lobbied the Chinese government, created the Institute for the History of Ancient Civilization in Changchun, where he was able to invite foreign experts to teach ancient world history, including ancient languages like, uh, um, uh, like ancient Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit. So these languages and that place became the, uh, the foundation uh, for world historical studies today. So this is the last chapter. Shall we move to the next slide, please? The concluding chapter of the book. Uh, so here you can see this image, this older gentleman, who actually is the grandson of uh, Zhou Wei Han, the first person that I mentioned. Remember that uh, gentry scholar who published world history, ancient world history in China in 1901. This is his grandson. And his grandson actually became the first Chinese, um, or first uh, person who came from China uh, to become a music professor at Columbia University. In other words, the Zhou Wei Han started the, the introduction of world history in China, started to promote this idea, China and the West, there was a little difference. And his grandson is still doing that because this person, the, the gentleman that we're seeing, he's famous for his effort to combine Western music with traditional Chinese music. It's a symbolic, but at the same time, it's a right moment for me to conclude uh, the chapter and the book. I would like to argue there are a couple of things we can learn if we re-examine the 100 years of history 
of the Chinese study of world history. One is no matter what was their position, the Chinese world history historians are never fully satisfied with the Eurocentric idea of world history. They were always trying to find alternatives to a world history that is based on Europe, they based on America. And in this process, there's energy, there's creativity, creativity there's a global re uh, relevance. So this is the first argument I can draw. And the second argument I'm drawing is over the long course of the 20th century, we can see this sort of a symbi symbiotic relationship between internationalism, global thinking, and the Chinese nationalism. In a way, Chinese nationalism and the global thinking is like the two sides of the same coin. They always exist at the same time. On the one hand, people embrace nationalism. On the other hand, there are at least a small minority of people in China who still embrace globalization and still are eager to learn about the outside world. And in fact, if you look at China today, this is especially relevant. On the one hand, everybody knows there is a strong rise of Chinese nationalism, xenophobia. On the other hand, at least if you look at what, what is happening in scholarly research, there's lots of young people who are eager to learn about the ancient Greece, ancient India, ancient Mesopotamia. So these two things, I believe, they are happening in China hand in hand. Um, maybe we can move to the last slide, please. So here, I would like to conclude my uh, today's presentation. Uh, I feel uh, it's 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 a great opportunity. It's a humble opportunity for me to talk about uh, Chinese views over the course of twentieth century. And again, I remind you, I'm a historian. So I'm trying to do this within the uh, uh, possibility uh, that history allows me to do so. So I have to be humble, and my knowledge about this issue is too limited. But there are three things I would like to briefly mention. One is what I just mentioned, isolation and the open-mindedness in China are existing at the same time. On the one hand, the Chinese government is, or the Chinese people can be very angry at the foreigners. On the other hand, they might be eager to learn about the foreign cultures, foreign languages, and foreign ideas. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, for a lot of people, especially in the foreign policy communities, they tend to regard Marxism or Marxist legacy in China as something obsolete, irrelevant. And some people even call it zombie. So Marxism in China is zombie. Are you going to bring zombie back? But at the same time, I think it's, uh, through my research, I feel in a way Marxism or the introduction of Marxism to world historical study created the basic infrastructure for people in China to make sense of the world. This infrastructure is not just about the knowledge, but also the social networking system. So in other words, even it's, <laughs> it's zombie, we still have to understand it. We have to pay attention to it. We have to study it, at least as a key sign. And the last point I would like to mention here is China and India are two rising powers in the world. And unfortunately today, it seems that we're moving apart, right? We're not coming along which is a shame. And knowing China in India or studying, uh, um, uh, studying India from China, I believe it is something that is truly meaningful for the future globalization process. We cannot uh, be ignorant of the other because we're the most important uh, future powers in the world. And for me, even doing world history in China, I greatly, I learned a lot from uh, a scholarship from India, especially post-colonial studies. For example, can you just one example? In the 1950s, when the communists took over China, 
that situation, I would argue, it is very much applicable uh, to the situation of colonial control in India. Why? Because the communists, they came from outside to the urban centers. They came from countries. They spoke different languages. They spoke different dialects. And they came with foreign ideas. And they came to control the system. So in a way, we can see some ideas are very inspiring from my research about 1950s in China from India. Especially the idea from Homi Baba, this sort of ambiguity created a agency, ambivalent created a possibility. So these are the issues I would like to offer in today's presentation. Again, I'm here to learn. So I would love to have a conversation with you instead of me presenting. So I welcome all the questions and I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Professor, for taking through different time periods. Uh, I now request my colleague, Ms. Sapna, to take in the questions from the chat box for the speaker. Thank you, sir. Um, audience, if you have any questions, please post those questions in the chat box. Um, so we have a few questions from uh, Sri L.V. Krishnan. I'll read those questions out. Mm -hmm. First question is, um, in which state does a nation tend to support internationalism? And when it is dependent on the rest of the world for resources or when it is self-sufficient. And the second question is, um, how does market competition impact internationalism? Oh, these are great, great questions. Uh, this is the reason why I need to be here. Uh, this is, uh, this is, these are great questions. Uh, let me start with the second one, uh, because I feel uh, my research is more related uh, to the second question. And uh, probably it's relatively, it's, uh, it's probably easier for me to answer the second question first. Uh, market competition is really, really important uh, for the rise of uh, internationalism in China because there's a drive among people who are curious about us outside the world. Um, of course, when we're talking about market, uh, market competition, marketization, um, we're looking at 100 years uh, in my book. And we, I can just use uh, the late Qing um, around one, uh, 1900 as example. At that time, the Chinese government, the Qing government, introduced world history into Chinese school curricula. In other words, school students, mid school students, college students, they had to study world history. And the thing about that, this is a country with hundreds of millions of population, and the students were eager to study world history. And what if you can publish the first textbook on world history? Right? So this is actually a good way for us to think about uh, the first chapter of my book, because the author of my book, he was trying to publish this book as a history textbook. And in a few places, that book actually became history textbook. So in other words, there is a drive for world history knowledge consumption in China from late Qing all the way to that day. So this is the first point I would like to respond to your question. But there's another point. That is, this question eventually reminds us how much agency we have as historians. Are we writing for the market or are we writing to educate the market? Especially in China today, you can see the market is diverse. Some people are naturally um, keen to learn the knowledge from world history, but others are very nationalistic. And the, then you can see there are publications are driven by the strong populist and nationalist movement. So for example, in the 1990s, late 1990s, there was a book called uh, That China Can Say No. And that book sold lots and lots of copies in China. And a lot of people argue that is a critical moment for the rise of uh, populist nationalism in China. 
In other words, there's this uh, uh, feedback e e effect, right, from the market to the writers. Now let me uh, move to the uh, more challenging question. Uh, the first question: In which state does a nation tend to, tend to support internationalism? Uh, one is it dependent on the rest of the world for resources? One is oh that is, again. This is a very uh, this is a very good question, and it is also a question for global historian and the world historian. Um, it forced me to think about uh, my project uh, uh, in a grander, uh, grander scale, right? This is a great question. Let me just uh, say a few words about that. Um, in China, the, at least from my case study, the Chinese government had a complicated relationship with internationalism due to the guiding ideology of that regime. So for example, in the 1920s, the early Republic of China was open to the world. And in fact, if you look at the Chinese constitution, right, from the 1900s, China was eager to embrace the world. And if you look at the recent scholarship on this, uh, Frank D. Kirk, right, uh, the famous uh, China historian, he would argue the Republican period was the time that China was open society. China was eager to embrace the world. Um, so this is a Republican period, especially the early Republican period. And at the same time, when we are talking about internationalism, we have to understand that this is a very complicated idea. It is not just liberal internationalism, but also socialist internationalism. In that sense, 1950s, early 1950s, was another period of internationalism in China. It is not liberal internationalism, it is a socialist internationalism. It's a time when the Chinese government was promoting the idea from the Soviet Union and apply them to China. So it's another period of uh, internationalism. Then 1980s, early 1980s, after the Mao era, um, there was a strong drive among Chinese liberal thinkers to embrace ideas from the world. And you can see at that time, many, many fundamental documents from uh, uh, world ideas were being translated in China, and there was a relatively um, uh, open atmosphere uh, in, in Chinese universities and Chinese public space for people to debate about uh, internationalism. So that's another period. And when we're looking at this, right, these three periods were not necessarily exactly co uh, related uh, to the resource drive. So sometimes we have to think about the relationship between uh, the people's understanding and uh, the real drive from the materialistic interest. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they turn against uh, each other. So for example, China today is a rising power, right? It's a, um, it's a huge industrial power, um, and it relies on world resources a lot, but not necessarily the Chinese government, well, some Chinese uh, politicians in government, not necessarily are they all embracing internationalism. So that's something that uh, we have to think about. Um, that's a great question. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Padmesh Shari. Do you think that the religion um, had an impact on Chinese identity? Absolutely. Uh, this is, again, a great question, and especially when we place China within the context of global references and comparison. Um, and for people who are doing uh, Chinese history and the religion study, um, this is a very difficult issue. That is, can we translate the word religion into Chinese? And how about Confucianism? Is that a religion or not? And this is a politically um, 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 mattered issue. So for example, in the um, uh, early stage of uh, the exchange between uh, uh, China and Europe, right, 17th century, uh, the Jesuits first came to China and they started to uh, introduce Christianity to the Chinese. But later, the church uh, argued Confucianism was 
could it be religion, right? So in that case, how do you reconcile Confucianism and with Christianity? And that created a lot of tension uh, in the early efforts of uh, this sort of relationship between uh, um, China and Europe. Same thing like Buddhism, right? Buddhism was introduced into China, and it was definitely a religion. But at the same time, in the later um, period of Chinese um, dynasties, so late imperial China, you can see Buddhism was fused, combined with Confucianism and Taoism. And then it created a Neo-Confucianism. Was Neo-Confucianism religion or not? Again, is an issue we're debating. So I guess for me, um, as I'm not an expert on Chinese religion, I would like to raise a question for uh, all of you, or maybe uh, remind you on this issue. When we are talking about religion, what do you mean? Are you using the Western concept of religion, or are you using Indian concept of religion? Do we have a Chinese concept of religion? But either way, right, there's ancient traditions from the past. These ancient traditions are very complex and they're open to various interpretations in the modern era. Maybe Confucianism could be regarded as religion. Maybe Buddhism that was introduced from India in China could be another right, a stream of religion. And these ideas, these traditions, definitely had a huge impact on China, on Chinese identity, even today. And especially I'm dealing with this sort of impact in the first chapter of my book. So thanks a lot for the question. Um, we have a few more questions from Sri N.V. Krishnan. Uh, the first question is, the Shang period is well known for beautiful bronze vessels. Where did the alloy components come from? And some scholars suggest outside sources based on the content of the lead isotopes. Your views. Oh, uh, this is a great question for me to uh, to to study uh, or for me to to look into. Uh, the Shang Dynasty uh, or the Shang period um, is a period of interaction and uh, communication between um, uh, central plains in China and the inner Eurasia. And in fact, we can definitely see that uh, um, um, maybe by the later period or early uh, Zhou Dynasty, um, the uh, bronze vessels, some people argue, were introduced from uh, the northwestern part of China into the central part of China. Uh, in other words, the very, very foundational period in China's tradition or China's civilization, um, Ch that region was famous for jade, jade industry. And the brown uh, vessels, or some people were, um, some people argue, uh, are sort of uh, influenced from uh, northwestern part of China. To, so today is western, northern part of China, right? But in the past, not necessarily uh, China, China. So uh, again, let me just be uh, uh, sorry. Let me step back a little bit. So when we are talking about China today, we cannot confuse this China today with Shang Dynasty, with civilizations um, in the Chinese region we call it today. So there are many, many smaller civilizational settlements in the area we call China today, and these are not necessarily so-called Chinese civilizations, right? And the Shang civilization was one of them, and the Zhou civilization was one of them. And the scholars have already shown these ancient civilizations, they communicated with each other, right? they learned from each other, and the fusion, right? the communication, the interaction, eventually created the foundation uh, for China. In other words, China was not an isolated civilization. China was an outcome of communication and interaction from various cultural traditions and the civilizational uh, traditions. So that's my uh, way to, to answer the question. But if you are interested, you can definitely look at Li Min, uh, who is teaching at the UCLA, 
or uh, my friend Xu Jin. Uh, the, these are really interesting works, but I'm well, more more than his art. Yes, the other two questions from Sri Elvi Krishna. Prevailing view is that the Yellow River Valley in the north was the region was the origin of Chinese civilization, and as the region was uh, peopled by the Hans, it became Han civilization. We are now told that about a few decades ago, archaeologists uncovered another civilization at Zhangjingdui uh, in uh, southwest China, as old if not older than the uh, Yellow River Valley. Artifacts from the site dated to be about three millennia old seem quite different from those seen before in China. If true, does it suggest that people there were different from the Hans? And the second question is, civilizations in the regions of the present-day India and China are dated to be four millennia old or more. Yet, China seemed to have become aware of India only since 140 BC by um, Zhang Quan from the Silk Road. But trade between India and China through Yunnan was going, going on at the time, not direct, but through intermediaries like Myanmar. Does it mean that the emperor in the north was unaware of the ongoing trade in the southwest? Oh, these are great questions. Um, I, I wish I'm uh, more equipped to answer these great questions. Um, you can see, uh, uh, or at least what I can see, that uh, uh, this scholar is trying to break the framework of Chinese civilization that we know. Right? In other words, so-called Chinese civilization it's multi-origin. Uh, it's 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 more complicated than we 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 thought. Um, but let me just uh, maybe uh, uh, make a few comments on this issue. Um, one is um, if you look at China today, the Han population um, is over ninety percent of the Chinese population. Is that amazing? Ninety percent of the population in China today is Han Chinese. How do we understand this? Are they really all Han Chinese? Or the Han Chinese population in itself, right, comes from many, many different origins. And I tend to believe the second one. That is, the Han Chinese is not one ethnicity. It is rather the confluent of many, many ancient peoples eventually you have Han Chinese. And a lot of people, well, I, had, I had an old professor teaching in Beijing, um, he passed away uh, years ago, when, and he would like to mention to me that is, uh, the Han Chinese or the Chinese civilization is the snowball effect. You know, the civilization evolves, evolves, and people in, right, became part of it. I wouldn't even call it a simulation. It's really the snow, snowball effect. And in that case, I absolutely agree with the possibility that uh, uh, in the southern part, in the Yangtze Delta River region, there were uh, civilizational remains that were even uh, probably more. Um, um, the history is probably longer than the Han Civ. It's possible. It's possible. But then uh, that's something we have to uh, talk about and debate among uh, um, professional archaeologists. So that's one thing. Uh, and the second thing is, I think, over the course of the 20th century, one major achievement for Chinese historians is they rethink the relationship between the past and the present. So in the 1920s, there was a historian called Gu Jiegang who started a movement. In that movement, Historians in China question the credibility of ancient Chinese history. Before Gu, right before 1920s, the Chinese view of history was the ancient was the best. You know, the ancient civilization in China was the standard of Chinese civilization. And then Chinese history is just going down, right? It's a history of decline. The best civilization, the best culture in China were, were the first the three dynasties in Chinese history, the Xia Shengzhou. But then the modern historians in China in the 20th century start to question the sort of link. They gradually realized that China is changing all the time. The China we have today 
is not necessarily the China we had 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. It's a myth, it's a construct, it's imagined community, right? So this is, I feel that uh, um, that's, that's something I'd, I would like to introduce in terms of uh, the history of modern China, right? Ancient civilization, really important, but at the same time, you cannot use ancient civilization to justify today's China, today's legitimacy of China being one single state. You cannot do that because it is uh, constructed, it is imagined. And speaking about that, uh, the awareness of India in ancient China, I think I could be wrong. I think the ancient Chinese probably knew India before uh, 140 BC, by before Zhangjie. And by the by the way, can we call India at the time? Right? Uh, uh, can we call China China? Can we call India India? Uh, and so I believe there were earlier cultural communications contacts. But uh, again, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a not an ancient uh, China scholar. So uh, don't 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 trust what I'm saying. But my sense is, um, according to the current research and progress in the field, um, the communication and the cultural contact between the territory we call China today and the territory we call India today probably longer than uh, one uh, uh, before uh, 140 BC. That's what I feel. I could be wrong. Uh, again, you can edu educate me on this. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Balasubramanian. How is the present modern nationalism under President Xi shaping national consciousness and China's view of the outside world? Yeah, this is a question that uh, um, um, that keeps uh, all of us um, um, awake at night, right? What's happening in China today? And what will happen to China in the future? And for me, uh, along with many scholars who are doing China studies, uh, one critical challenge we have to study China is, um, you probably also know that, um, the current um, um, Chinese government's decision-making process is so opaque. In other words, uh, we can guess, we can assume, we can imagine, but we don't really have the opportunity to have the documents uh, to record this decision-making process. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, um, because of the COVID-19 and because um, the um, um, COVID policy in China, it's really hard for uh, scholars to travel to China to do interviews with uh, leaders in the Chinese government. So it, uh, um, it makes the, uh, the challenge even more uh, difficult, right? And that's what we are facing. Um, in that case, uh, I'm not sure the right way to look at China's nationalism is through leaders' psychology. You probably can do that. And the scholars are doing that. And then maybe uh, they have um, um, better data than I have. I'm not sure it's the best way of doing that. Uh, but of course, I'm a historian. So I tend to look at archives and to look at primary sources. Um, and I don't assume that the Chinese nationalism is a state engineered project either. I tend to respect the agency of the people. So, in other words, I don't think the rise of Chinese nationalism is something that the Chinese government engineered. It's not, you know, one leader says China has to have nationalism, so China has. I don't think so. I think there is a more complicated process um, among populist psychology and the collective identity in China. And the, of course, it's related to history education, but at the same time, it also, I think, uh, I could be wrong, we have to understand the way through which foreign media look at China is part of the issue, it's part of the problem as well. Right? When uh, the Chinese uh, travel abroad, 
a lot of times they are actually become more nationalistic. So I'm not sure what's happening in India, but the, a lot of my friends who uh, are from China, they go to other countries and they become more nationalistic. But maybe there's a reason of that, right? The global uh, system of understanding China is tilted uh, against the Western view. So, um, so in that case, I, I, I think we have to look at the issue uh, from both inside and outside. And we have to get beyond individual leaders and we have to appreciate the agency of the people. So that's the way I'm, uh, I'm responding to this question, but I could be wrong. Again, I'm a, I'm a historian, right? Could be wrong. Thanks. The next question is from Colonel R. Hariharan. How do you view President Xi's emphasis on achieving the Chinese dream as part of his assertion of Chinese nationalism uh, as part of PRC's worldview? Oh, great. This is again, this is a great question. I uh, had a colleague, I have a colleague and a friend, um, uh, Professor Terry Brown. He writes a book about Xi Jinping, um, um, his biography. Um, and I remember in the talk that he, he gave the, here in Göttingen a couple of years ago, um, he mentioned uh, uh, this idea, the Chinese dream. Um, Chinese dream is a beautiful story that you want to share with the middle class people in China. It's how you tell a story. Through telling that story, you uh, legitimate your position. Chinese dream is really a nice story. And of course, uh, today, if you look at uh, Chinese social media, we know Chinese dream is a story that some people can entertain, but not all the Chinese in, uh, in China. Um, so um, Chinese dream, is a great story to tell, but also is a story that can be told only to part of the Chinese population. Uh, again, goes back to um, to what I mentioned uh, before, right? Chinese population is as diverse as the Indian population is. If Indian society, right, has different segments, middle class people. Uh, people who are aspiring to become a, you know, rich in the power and people on the top leaders or politicians, the Chinese society seem to be the same. And in that case, you can tell Indian story, or Indian dream, you can also tell a Chinese dream. And don't forget there's American dream, which is uh, um, being told again and again, but look at what's happening in that country. So um, that's my view on this, but thanks a lot for the question. Uh, the next question is from uh, Murli Dhiran Nair. Does the current leadership in China believe that the old concept of Tianjia empowers them to lead the world, if not rule over it? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, this person, uh, this scholar definitely um, um, is very familiar with uh, the uh, Chinese um, political discourse. Tianxia, uh, Tianxia, if we translate it into English, means all under heaven. This goes back to the ancient uh, Chinese thinking that the, the Chinese emperor is son of heaven and China is the middle kingdom and the world is Tianxia, all under heaven. And of course, uh, the, uh, the rhetoric is uh, the Chinese emperor as the son of heaven receive the mandate of heaven ruling the middle kingdom under all under heaven. Uh, so in a way, this is a, a spatial uh, um, spatial um, distribution and uh, structure of uh, uh, configuration of power. This power is a latched power, right? This is not a power that the Chinese emperor, the Chinese son of heaven truly owned. So in that case, it's uh, imaginary. But I would like to bring up the other perspective so on the one hand, you can say embracing the idea of Tianxia is aggressive because pretty much you claim all the places belong to China. But don't forget, the idea of Tianxia came from the time when the Chinese had no conscience of national boundaries and the national territories. In other words, when we're dealing with international relations theories, we're really in the model, model the ground. On the one hand, 
we would like to use the concept from India, from China, to enrich that, you know, that vocabulary system, right? To create more interesting, interesting ideas. On the other hand, we're still operating in that system. So we're bring, bring in Chinese ideas into a system that is deeply Eurocentric. And in that process, we, 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 in a way, we translate, but at the same time, we manipulate these ideas. We transform the ideas and we, we change these ideas. So my argument is, if you really want to talk about this Chinese view of the world, perhaps you have to understand Tianxia is not operating in the system of a national territory. It is not Westphalian, not Westphalian, not West, West, Westphalian, sorry, I'm English that word, Westphalian system that we're talking about. It's not about the national sovereignty. It is not about the popular sovereignty. It is not about self determination, right? It is not even about religion. So, in that case, we have to, I think, together, we should all uh, do this together. We have to, if we want to challenge Eurocentric international relations theory, we have to go back to our ancient traditions, but we cannot just choose and pick, right? We really have to go to to restructure, right? Or create a new 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 thinking. I guess this is something we have to do all together, not just the Chinese. I think Indian scholars um, have been doing this, and it's better we do this together. Thank you. So the next question is from Commodore R S Vasan. On the, issue, on, um, on the issue of Hanization, as brought out by you, there are reports that the consolidate, uh, to consolidate their position and power, Chinese are resorting to settlement of hands in Tibet and other areas of interest. How do you look at this development while new questions are being raised about Tibet being part of China? Oh yeah, this is a great question. Uh, this is a really a political sensitive issue. Um, as a historian, again, um, I uh, tend to be uh, reluctant to uh, uh, judge the current situation. But um, um, this goes back to history. Um, and not necessarily Han uh, um, synthesization is not necessarily uh, China's uh, Han, Hanization, uh, the word the, the scholar used here. <clears throat> um, the Chinese expansion or the so-called Chinese expansion into Tibet was really taking place in the Qing dynasty. And remember, Qing dynasty was not a Han Chinese empire, right? The uh, Qing dynasty was really the Manchu dynasty. And therefore, uh, when we're looking at this, this is not just Hanization. It's really a historical process that was integrated into the complicated uh, foreign policy uh, decision making process and of course um, i i feel i should say a little about this because i'm manchu uh, so i have this legacy from the Qing. well i wasn't noble family anything or family was not noble at all but uh, um, so here we have to be aware of the the word which we, we choose right this is not necessarily Han, hanization maybe today we can use the term but uh, at least uh, looking at the process uh, when uh, Tibet became part of uh, the Chinese influence, it really happened uh, in the time of uh, the Manchu dynasty. Why? Because Manchu dynasty was a time where when a small minority population ruling the majority Han population. In other words, the Manchus were insignificant portion of the population and that they could not effectively control the entire Han Chinese population. Therefore, the Manchus needed the islands. And who were their best allies? The Mongols, the Mongolian population. And at that time, the Mongols and the part of the Manchus were under influence of Tibetan Buddhism. So the Manchus wanted to control Tibet because they wanted uh, to control their uh, Baisa allies, the Mongols. So you can see the geographical, uh, geopolitical interest in the grand strategy of the Qing dynasty. So that's the beginning of the issue. But today, I think the issue becomes another matter. That is how the Chinese government today 
reconciles its own legacy from the Qing Dynasty, from the Ming Dynasty, even go uh, goes all the way back to the to the Shang Dynasty or uh, uh, Jade Civilization we're talking about here. So that's another story uh, we, we can tell. But uh, thanks a lot for raising this question. Uh, the next question um, is from Ms. Anupama. China has around 55 ethnic minorities. Could you throw some light on their idea of Chinese nationalism and if they are different from the mainstream Han nationalism? Or have most of these minorities been brought into the mainstream through the process of Hanization? Uh, yeah, again, this is a great question. Um, this question, uh, in a way, um, maybe um, I, I can answer the question a little because I'm a minority, right? I am soft a minority. I belong to that the, the other 50 uh, five minority, uh, I think minorities. Um, so, but again, um, there are people who are better equipped to, to answer this question. Um, I would say when we are looking at China, oftentimes we have assumption that China is one country, one people, one civilization. And in fact, Jeff Wasserstrom in his uh, book on 20, 21, I think 100 questions for 21st century China, or something like that, right? The, the famous historian uh, Jeff, Jeffrey uh, Wasserstrom, and he argues the biggest uh, um, mistake that the Westerners have on China is they tend to assume China is homogeneous, which is not. And I really would like to invite you to look at China through Indian lens. Isn't the Indian population diverse? I think probably more diverse than the Chinese population is. But still, right, we're dealing similar issues, very similar issues. We have a very rich and a diverse legacy of our culture, of our civilization. And we try to, or we managed to convert that civilization into a global system that is being recognized by the West. In that process, we introduce ethnicities, right? We introduce races, we introduce uh, um, um, political legitimacy the theories, right? But in that process, we're gaining a lot, but at the same time, we're losing some. I think in this process, introducing ethnicities into China, on the one hand, recognize the diversity of the Chinese population, which is a good thing. On the other hand, these ethnicity populations are, some people argue, um, state engineered project. Some ethnicities were not supposed to be there. And some ethnicity should have been broken into pieces. And even the Han Chinese, right, it's not a pure. So I wonder why do we have to stick to the idea of ethnicity to imagine our future? Would the India be doing the same thing, turning your country into multiple ethnicities and start to having multiple issues? So that's something I've been thinking, right? This is me uh, uh, thinking a lot. But at the same time, while the Chinese are embracing the Western idea of ancestry, they're doing it wrong, right? They're creating some artificial boundaries, and they're creating problems that we shouldn't have today. Um, so and speaking about the question, I think different ancestry, different ethnic groups in China have a different views. Some uh, ethnicities are more uh, pro, so more like Chinese Chinese, so they have no problem with Chinese identity. Others, it's a more complicated issue. And you, we really have to speak um, on each ethnicity. But uh, thanks a lot for the question. Uh, due to time cons constraints, this will be the last question. Um, is, the C is the Chinese co Communist Party that is central to all that is happening in China? Where would you like to position the party in the scheme of history and what shape will it take in the next few decades? Oh, this is a great question. Um, for a lot of people um, outside of China, they tend to see the Communist Party um, as a superficial project. 
And indeed, today, uh, if you look at the Communist Party, it has over 90, uh, 90 million population. So it's almost the size of a nation. And if you talk to the party members, lots of them have no idea about communism at all. So is that superficial? On the one hand, maybe the answer is yes. Right? Many of the party members, they have little, very little about the, what communism really is. Uh, but on the other hand, as a historical uh, structure, um, Communist Party at this point is the only viable political system that China has. So in other words, you may be able to get rid of that system, but then what else do you have? It's not like in India, you have uh, multiple parties competing against each other, and all these parties are well, uh, well, well, well established, well structured. But in China, there's very little alternative votes. So this is not my opinion. Um, I had this conversation with scholars in China and also of China. A lot of people feel that the, the party is evolving, right? The party is evolving. And then maybe the evolution of the party could be the future, instead of just getting rid of it and create a new one. But of course, um, I cannot predict the future, right? At least from my point of view, we're still dealing with the uh, socialist and the Marxist, Marxist legacy when we're looking at uh, China today. Even the Chinese view of the world is not 100% traditional, not 100% shaped by Confucianism. There's still strong influence of Marxism in it. So whether or not it is your legacy, whether or not it's good legacy back as you can debate about it, but that's your legacy. Can we reject who we are? So that's the question we have to think about. But thanks a lot for this question. Thank you, uh, Professor, for patiently taking all the questions. And thank you, Sapna, for uh, moderating the Q&A session. Uh, I think we have come to the end of the session. I now request Commodore Vijesh Kumar Garg, BSM, Executive Director, Chennai Center for China Studies, to deliver the concluding address and vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Balok. <clears throat> well, the world history writing had a very strong presence in China throughout the 20th century. This served as a powerful resource to counter the norm, narrow nationalism, and Chinese historians have made their important contribution that continue to resonate the debate about the known Eurocentric form of global history. This is the account of development of world history as a discipline and practice in modern China today. I mean, say post uh, in 20th century. Dr. Fan in his book has brought out, in fact, he gone through the scholars throughout the 20th century who sought to connect the global connection with the China. This book also comes out with an important uh, story about the way in which Chinese scholarship has understood its relationship with the outside world. And it also tells how the world history must look China from their perspective. In his presentation, last one hour or so, Dr. Fan presented his book chapter by chapter to all of us through beautiful slides and all the illustrations, examples. In fact, each chapter, he not only for the contents and four contents, he also gave it to us chapter by chapter. And what is the last one was very important, chapter five, in which he said the continuity, the transformation, and world history in post Mao China, that is from Marxist to cultural nationalism. He took all the questions of beautifully in detail. In fact, I was very happy when Mr. Nair asked a question with Chinese word references, and he he made the meaning to all of us. We understood some terms of Chinese now. But what I like the best, he gave message to all of us, was knowing Chinese in India as both a rising past for tomorrow. It is equally important for both the countries to know each other's history. Why a stand? Why not so much? And it is required for all of us who are studying the country's history and the culture. What remains from you is to thank Dr. Chin Fan for connecting us from Germany, 
printing the discussion on his book. Very fascinating book. I just read the Kindle version. And after hearing you chapter by chapter, I'm quite confirmed what I've read is right, understood is right. Thank you so much for spending time with us. I'd like to see you more with us because history is one thing, as Koda Vasan said, unless you understand the history of a country, whether you are a military man or you are a politician or you are a or, or a cultural uh, or, 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 or a cultural faculty, unless you go deep in the history and know why, so what happened, what is lead to what, you can't understand a country properly. Thank you so much for the message. On behalf of the Director General and all the members of C3S and the audience, I thank you so much for your presence with us. I'd like to thank our distinguished members, all the audience, for their presence and their participation with the nice questions. And I'm forgetting my duty if I don't uh, thank my colleagues from C3S team who organized this uh, beautiful session. And contacting uh, Dr. Infan was not so easy, but we were so approachable. Thank you so much, all of you. Jai Hind. Thank you so much.